Welcome everyone. I'm Laura Tanji, University Librarian at UC Irvine. And we are offering a live transcription of this event, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen by selecting closed captioning or view the full transcript. I'd like to start today's program with UCI Library's acknowledgement of our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Ahashiman and Tongva peoples. We are so pleased you joined us for today's Seeking Asylum, Then and Now, with Rory Kennedy and Scott Miller. This program is part of an event series held in conjunction with the Americans in the Holocaust, a traveling exhibition for libraries co-sponsored by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the American Library Association. Now this exhibition examines the motives, pressures, and fears that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war, and genocide from 1933 to 1945. And UCI Libraries is one of 50 sites in the United States and the only Southern California site selected to display this traveling exhibition. It will be available for viewing until March 9th in the lobby of the Jack Langston Library at UCI. And we're excited to bring this exhibition and related events to UCI and the broader Orange County community. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce UCI's Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor and Chancellor's Professor of Statistics, Hal Stern. Welcome, Provost Stern. Thank you, Lorelei. Take a second for my video to turn on. It always does. There I am. Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I appreciate the introduction. I'm really excited to be a part of, of this event and want to thank in advance uh, Rory Kennedy and Scott Miller for joining us to share their important work. Uh, I want to start by saying just a couple of things about the exhibit uh, before turning to tonight's event. Um, I want to congratulate you, Lorelai, and thank you for the great work that you and your team have done in bringing this U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and American Library Association exhibit to our campus. Hosting Americans and the Holocaust is extremely important for UCI because it provides our students, our faculty, our staff, as well as the surrounding community, the Southern California community, an opportunity to explore the environment that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war and genocide in Europe in the, during the 1930s and 40s. As is well known, looking at the past helps us learn from other experiences and forms the present and hopefully the future in important ways. Um, in this case, the Holocaust exhibit speaks to dealing with prejudice, bias, and racism, uh, topics that sadly remain all too prevalent. Uh, I want to note uh, the exhibit is well aligned to a broader campus initiative and make sure the audience is aware of this campus initiative, which is the Confronting Extremism Initiative run by our UCI Office of Inclusive Excellence. So during the course of each year, uh, they run a series of programs as well uh, on these important topics. Uh, tonight's program is especially important and especially meaningful to me. Uh, on a personal level, I want to say that um, I have uh, family, uh, somewhat distant relatives that left Europe uh, during pre prior to and during World War II, um, Jewish family members. And uh, so I'm quite familiar with the challenges and with the story of the St. Louis, which we'll hear a little bit about tonight. Um, as the title for tonight's uh, exhibit, uh, a, a presentation, Seeking Asylum Then and Now, indicates this question of um, individuals seeking asylum, what are the obligations of the world? Um, what are the best ways to, to deal with these situations? It remains uh, incredibly relevant. In fact, as you all will well know, um, when I sat down to write notes for this just a week ago, I thought, oh, I should mention the important instances of refugees um, in, in recent history, Syria, Sudan, Venezuela. Um, there are just so many. Um, but of course, the occurrences of the last week uh, bring it 
screaming into you know our living rooms uh, at, at the present time with the the terrible events um, in Ukraine and the more than half million people that have already been dislocated um, in that in that battle. So um, these issues are. Uh, extremely important for us to, to learn about, uh, to talk about, um, and to hopefully uh, raise the compassion uh, of our society. And so uh, having said all that, uh, again, a welcome to Rory and Scott, and I will turn it back to you, Lorelai, to do the introductions. Thank you, Provost Stern, for your very timely remarks. This evening's program will be moderated by Tatiana Bryant. Tatiana joined the UCI libraries in 2020 and serves as the research librarian for digital humanities, history and African-American studies. A New York native, she earned her BA in history from Hampton University and holds an MPA from NYU and an MSLIS from Pratt Institute. Tonight, we will hear from documentary filmmaker, Rory Kennedy, and former director of curatorial affairs at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, Scott Miller. Rory Kennedy is one of America's most prolific documentary filmmakers and an Academy Award nominated, primetime Emmy Award winning director and producer of more than 40 highly acclaimed documentaries. And her latest project will tell the story of the refugee ship MS St. Louis. Now, Scott Miller is the co-author of the book, Refuge Denied, the St. Louis Passengers and the Holocaust. Prompted by a former passenger's curiosity, he and his co-author, Sarah A. Ogilvie, set out to discover what happened to each of the 937 passengers and their investigation spanning 10 years and half the globe took them to unexpected places and produced surprising results. Rory and Scott, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Tatiana. Thank you, Lorelai. So how do we engage with lessons from the Holocaust in our public discourse regarding the modern day refugee crisis? in the US and around the world without demeaning the memory of the Holocaust. I wanna thank documentary filmmaker Rory Kennedy and former director of curatorial affairs at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, Scott Miller for participating in this conversation today. So this question is for both of you to, to start off with. Um, and it's a bit of a long question, forgive me. After public, after public figures attempted to analogize indefinite migrant detention, detention facilities on the US southern border to concentration camps in Europe during the 1930s and 1940s, the US Holocaust Museum put out a statement in June of 2019 stating that it unequivocally rejects efforts to create analogies between the Holocaust and other events, whether historical or contemporary. This is a question for both of you again. How is your work inspired by or in conversation with Holocaust survivors and descendants of survivors who are immigration activists protesting the US border wall and immigration crisis? You wanna jump in, Scott? Okay, well, I'll just um, say that, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Unfortunately, here now is Washington, DC. I wish I was in California uh, with all of you, but um, you know, one of the greatest um, aspects of my career, uh, if, if not my really of my life, that's given me so much satisfaction has been my contact with Holocaust survivors and um, the, the passion that survivors have shown me in terms of their sympathy and their, their protest against uh, unfair immigration policies or uh, contemporary genocide. I, I do have to add that survivors are not a monolith. When you, I don't like saying the survivors, but having said that, again, I'm just uh, just so moved by the role that survivors or their descendants have played in various um, uh, uh, protest movements, either in the um, uh, on the Mexican border or protesting in action in the face of um, I would, contemporary genocide, post Holocaust genocide. This was a generation of people who were promised never again. And it's really been again and again and again, the racism, the hatred, 
uh, the um, restrictive immigration policies genocide. And, um, you know, I was at the Save Darfur rally in Washington, D.C. It was tens of thousands of people. And it was a Holocaust survivor that just blew us all away when she spoke. Or um, another survivor at the Holocaust Museum who took a photograph of a survivor from the genocide in Rwanda. Um, so they're, they're in the, the engagement of survivors and their descendants moves me uh, and motivates me you know, every day. Thank you for that, Scott, beautifully said. Um, so just for a bit of context, I'm making a feature documentary about the current refugee crisis. Um, and we're also looking back specifically to two points in history to help us understand what's happening today. One of those points is prior to World War II and looking at the events that led up to the Holocaust and the fact that um, prior to World War II, there were many Jewish people who were in Germany who were trying to get out of Germany. And there were very few countries who were willing to accept them. And there was at that point really no international policies of how to deal with people who were being persecuted in their own country. So we look at that period of time, and it, in that context, we tell the story of the MS St. Louis, which I'm sure we'll get into in greater detail. Um, and then we jump to another point in time, which was after World War II, after the Holocaust, um, where we had a situation where there were 60 million people who had been displaced. Um, we, we, we came together and formed the United Nations in 1945 so that we could be, that, that there would be a, a unified uh, way to deal with a whole range of problems and challenges that individual countries were facing and that the consensus was that it was much more strategic to do it together. Um, and in addition to, to the United Nations, we, in 1948, we also had the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, where Article 14-1 uh, uh, committed that everyone has the right to seek asylum from persecution in another country. They can go to another country if they're being persecuted. Um, and then in addition to that, in 1951, we had the, the Refugee Convention where the word refugee was defined for the first time and a whole set of rights were granted. So we look at those moments in history um, to help us better understand today and what's happening? Have we, have we as um, individual countries, as collective countries, kept to the promises that we made um, in these post World War II declarations? Have we learned the lessons of what uh, happened during World War II? Um, and and so we usually so it's we're really not making any connection to the actual Holocaust, to the challenges that. Um, that that people who are looking for refuge face today, um, and I would never, I personally would never want to to do that. Thank you. Um, can both of you speak to the connection between immigration policy and racism and xenophobia? Are they baked into the system? or are they chosen to be leveraged when it's expedient to do so, whether during times of war or elections? Sorry. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> that's a big question. I think you should start, Scott, and I'll fill okay, it. I, I, I will just say that it is, um, I think, as you said, baked into the system. Um, we've, um, America's had immigration um, laws that um, if nothing else, their, their names are to the point. I mean, there's the 1891 um, Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and just a few years ago, there was a Muslim ban. Um, so yes, they were um, uh, traditionally, they have been, or many times uh, they have been in, 
immigration policy has been embedded to a degree in racism. To be sure, there have been other factors, including during the 1930s that did affect the St. Louis in terms of um, uh, America being in the midst of a depression. And there were also security concerns, whether they were well-founded con security concerns is another issue, um, but there was uh, security concerns, however, in the 1920s and 1924, <clears throat> excuse me, the Johnson Reed Act was a, a also an act um, that was um, to keep out racially undesirable elements uh, from the United States. And they were a quota in favor of Northern uh, and uh, uh, Western Europe. Um, and they were really, um, they targeted Southern and Eastern Europe, which targeted Jews and Catholics. And uh, yes, these were um, racially based and, and, and motivated. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with that and completely. I think there's countless examples um, in, in both the US history as well as uh, wealthy European nations uh, policies over over the you know many decades where you can see that xenophobia and racism underlie it. Um, you know, prior to World War II, um, eighty five percent of the people who were let into the United States at that time were from Northern and Western Europe and were primarily white Anglo Saxon Protestant people. Um, and from associated countries. Um, less than 2% of the people were coming from Asia or Africa, the Pacific Islands. So, you know, just in terms of, of the sheer numbers and the statistics, uh, you, could, you could see that play itself out in, in, in very racist and, and religious terms. Um, you know, when my family came over in the 1800s from Ireland, uh, during the potato famine, there were signs all over Boston, no Irish need apply, primarily because they were Irish Catholics, right? So um, there were religious undertones uh, to this as well. And then, you know, you see a shift. I mean, I think there's, I think there's certainly a, a way to look at it um, where immigration policies are, 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 motivated by the economy. So if you're at a place where, you know, you need cheap labor in a particular country, um, we, we become more open-minded and a little less racist. And when we're at different junctures where we're coming out of the Great Depression or there's um, insecurity for a range of reasons, then I think that people tend to be uh, more xenophobic and the policies tend to be more racist. And then I think you could look at it, you know, there's other factors like what is the administration? I mean, just, you know, looking at the difference between the Biden administration and the Trump administration, the Trump administration said their, you know, their policy was to reduce the, to basically dismantle the entire immigration system that had been built up primarily since 1975 in this country. And uh, after the Vietnam War um, and reduce the number of people coming into this country to 15,000, um, you know, and then they had the, the ban on Muslim countries, which obviously was, was had racist undertones. Um, Biden, you know, has increased that number now to 125,000 people. So, you know, it, it can, it can change in time. It can change because of administrations. It can have all these other factors at play, like, uh, the number of jobs available. Thank you. Uh, this is for Rory. Thinking about your documentary work on immigration and border security, do you see parallels between the 2006 Secure Fences Act and U.S. government efforts by FDR, Secretary of State Hull, and Secretary of Treasury Morgan Thau to keep the St. Louis from docking in Miami in 1939? Yes. Um, and I, I kind of answered the question a little bit in the previous question, but I do think that if you look back in our history um, and compare those two moments that, you know, there's absolutely parallels between them. Um, I think American people have had very mixed feelings over these many decades about having immigrants and, and migrants and refugees coming into this country. 
Um, you know, in 1939, 1938, FDR was, um, was the, the country was coming out of the Great Depression. There was, I think, almost 17, 18% of the population uh, didn't have jobs. And so there was a lot of anxiety and, and I think a lot of fear having come out of, of a period of immense uh, turmoil in this country. So I think the idea of letting people in created a lot of uh, fear and anxiety, increased anxiety for folks. So, you know, the, the, the polls at that time, even allowing for the, the people on the St. Louis, it was less than a thousand people on the St. Louis. It wasn't going to disrupt anything in the United States. We could certainly absorb them, but there was an argument of a slippery slope. If we let them in, everybody else is going to come over on boats. They're going to take our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there was a, there was a backlash against it. Um, in 2006, you know, I, and you were bringing that up because I also made a, a film way back when, you know, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, called The Fence, about the fence we built on the southern border. So uh, referencing the Secure Fence Act of 2006, um, which basically authorized Congress to, to build, you know, 700, uh, increase the wall on the southern border, uh, 1,700 miles of fencing. Um, and, you know, that was coming in the aftermath of 9-11, right? So there was a lot of fear about um, people coming in. It was it was actually less in that context about jobs, and it, although that was part of it, but it was more about, you know, people are going to come here and then they're going to they're, they're going to be terrorists and they're going to walk across the southern border. And there was a lot of fear as a result of that. Um, but in any case, and then you have people like Hillary Clinton who signed that act, right? It's not, it wasn't just Republicans, it was Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, so I think it's, and, and you raised it with the first question a little bit, the, the kind of balance between politics and, um, and these policies and, people getting elected or not getting elected is all in the mix of these kinds of decisions, right? So you're gonna sign that act because you wanna get elected the next election cycle. And if your population is fearful and it's being fed by the media, that's gonna impact what decision you make and what you vote on. And you know, it's all uh, very connected. Thank you. Scott, throughout the book, you mentioned serendipitous connections and discoveries from happening upon Benno Joseph's grave in New Jersey while lost to finding Marianne Meyerhoff's um, based on PhD research of a, of a museum member. Can you talk more about the role serendipity plays in your work as a researcher and in the work of historians and archivists more generally? Yeah, so um, clearly serendipity, um, Played a great role in my research to try to trace the fate of all the St. Louis passengers. You can call it serendipity, um, maybe luck, coincidence, um, fate. I, I, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, I hope everyone has it. I hope other historians have it because no set of records are complete if you're doing document, you know, document archival research, including German records. Is a myth of perfect, perfect. Uh, Nazi records. They're good, but they're not perfect. They're not comprehensive. Um, and in the case of the um, uh, St. Louis passenger you met, men uh, mentioned Benno Joseph. He was deported to Auschwitz. And um, it surprises people that there's no list of, um, when, uh, of Jews who were gassed at Auschwitz. When Jews arrived at Auschwitz um, and sent to the gas chamber, they were not listed by name. Benno Joseph, as it turns out, um, was one of the passengers uh, chosen for forced labor. Uh, whether he died in Auschwitz or not, we, we didn't know. We saw that he was chosen for forced labor on a document. And yes, I was in a cemetery in Paramus, New Jersey and wandering. And I did see a grave for someone named Benno Joseph with, with a matching date of birth. 
And subsequently through the cemetery, I was able to contact a family member and it's a much longer story. Um, I should add, I wasn't just wandering around any cemetery. It was a cemetery where um, uh, many, many uh, survivors were buried from the German Jewish survivor community of Washington Heights in New York City. So that's why I was there looking for other graves that I knew were there and I happened upon Benno Joseph's grave. But um, yes, it was just serendipity. We had assumed since we had no proof to the contrary that he uh, was killed at Auschwitz. Well, I'm just going to add, thank you for sharing that, Scott, that I um, I had many experiences along those lines. I always, uh, I, I refer to it, to the, the documentary gods who come through at these moments, and um, but uh, so many serendipity stories as well. Thank you. Um, Rory, given the variety of work you've directed and produced, why are the border crisis, U.S. immigration policy, and asylum seekers, why are those particularly compelling subjects for you to return to as a documentary filmmaker? Well, you know, we're, we're facing the greatest refugee crisis since World War II. Um, and I feel... Uh, that it's imperative that we have a global response to this crisis. Um, when I made the fence, it was very much about US policy, why we were building this fence, what was working about it, what wasn't working about it. Um, but to me, the refugee crisis is really about that the solution to it has to be a universal solution that we have to come together across countries to address this crisis. Um, right now we have over 26 million refugees who are in the world today. We have um, 80 million people who are displaced. Um, there are already 500,000 people who have been displaced in the last week in the by the U, in the Ukraine because of Russia, um, we had the underlying causes are uh, projected to only get worse. Things like climate change, um, uh, non-state actors who are empowered and militarized like ISIS, um, the increased militarization of the world. Um, th these issues are only going to make the situation worse. And yet we really, we aren't keeping to our commitment, our post-World War II commitments. Um, we are not providing the uh, support that, that these refugees need. Many of these refugees, if they're lucky enough to get into another country and to, once they leave their country, they end up in these resettlement camps where they live for on average 17 years. So, you know, now we have a policy where we, okay, you can you live in this camp, but they're not given, they're, they're not given passports. They're not given the ability to get jobs. They're not given an education. They're barely given healthcare. There, it's no, it's no way to lead a life and it's not productive and it's not helpful. Um, and I think that, you know, the Ukraine situation with Russia is a, is a really great example of the need for a universal policy. Poland, I mean, God love the Polish people for already accepting about 300,000 uh, Ukrainians. It should not be all on Poland, right? We need to all take our share, you know, just because they're a neighboring country doesn't mean that they should have the burden of that many people in such a short period of time. We all need to step up, say, okay, how many people are going to come out of there? The United States, you know, we can proportionately take on this percentage of the people. Britain can take on this percentage. Ireland can take on this percentage. We all need to collectively do our part in a situation like this. Thank you. Um, Scott, I have a, a bit of a long question for you again. 
In the book, you talk about the missing social fabric of Jewish life in Germany because of a loss of gravestones, which are physical markers of community and history, as well as a loss of documents like photographs, vital records, and correspondence. You relay a remarkable story in the book about the importance of the evidence of social fabric when you describe how Marianne Meyerhoff came to be in possession of her mother Charlotte's family photographs, which were fastidiously guarded, uh, safeguarded by her grandparents over time, bit by bit in the coat lining of a family friend and at great risk to herself. As the former director of curatorial affairs at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, have you come across similar stories of rescued social fabrics in your research for this book? or in your work more generally? Yes, I don't know if you have all night because I could, uh, my answer will be, could be a lot longer than your question because uh, the Holocaust Museum, yeah. I mean, there are thousands of collections of that sort of lost or what would have been lost social fabric if people did not um, donate them uh, to the museum. That's a, a plug if there are any Holocaust survivors or their descendants or camp liberators or witnesses to the Holocaust uh, watching tonight to, uh, if you have material, um, to donate them to the Holocaust Museum. Um, you know, there's, uh, there was a family on the St. Louis, the Dublon family. They were two brothers, Willie and, Eric Dublon, Willie and Eric Dublon and their wives and children. And we only had one photograph of them very happily on board the St. Louis on the way to Cuba. And um, a few years later, when we were uh, searching for information on St. Louis passengers, we were contacted by a man actually in the LA uh, area who sent a photo of the youngest Dublon girl, Lori Dublon. Um, he was like her childhood sweetheart. And uh, he sent a photo from like a little a party in kindergarten. And they're all, and Lori Dublon is there in a bow and a dress and with all her girlfriends. And, um, you know, just that one photo is just so precious of the world that was and was taken away. And, um, it's not as large as the Meyerhoff collection, which was hundreds and hundreds of photos, uh, but uh, you know, still, it just it, it it illustrates, you know, just happy day, um, part of the social fabric of Jews in Germany uh, before Hitler. Um, that's one example. As I said, I could that question. I could be here all night, but again, I, I make a plea to um, survivors and their descendants: donate your material to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, who can uh, who will not only acquire the material, they will conserve the material. The museum conservators treat every piece like like it's the Mona Lisa. That's how important and valuable it is to the museum. And then we'll make it digitally accessible. So anyone in the world with an internet connection can access this material. So um, thank you for that question. Absolutely. Uh, and this question is for both of you. How do each of you imagine current and future historians, genealogists, archivists, and documentarians of the border will grapple with these losses, especially considering the limited capacity to recover um, the remains of missing migrants and asylum seekers at the border and the separation of, family, of families and subsequent non-familial non -familial adoption of children? A I'll just one. be quick on that. I know you know, Rory is doing this research now. I'm hoping that survivors of this experience are being interviewed um, and giving oral histories because um, down the road, that's, um, you know, one very important tool for, um, for historians. It certainly is for Holocaust historians. Thank God for survivors who give their um, uh, oral, uh, given oral history interviews. Um, you know, also historians will be able to look at news clips, um, you know, CNN and, um, and newspaper. This, this material is, these stories are being covered on page one of newspapers. It's something that did not happen during the Holocaust. There was, first of all, there was no television. And when there was stories of atro Nazi atrocities that were buried on page 25. Um, so I think this is an advantage that historians will have now, at least they will visually be able to see uh, what took place with all the uh, media coverage. I think that's right. I mean, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, I um, often go back to the origin of that word document and the importance of documenting things as they happen. I think there's um, a really, you know, 
fantastic, eclectic group of documentary filmmakers uh, out there in the world today. And many of them have spent time on the border documenting what's happening and what happened there specifically under the Trump administration, but also what's happening still. Um, and I've certainly spent a good amount of time there, you know, in the making of, of the fence. Um, and then now this documentary as well. Um, so I think that's of great value. I think as, as Scott said, you know, to, in this day and age, people do have cell phones, refugees have cell phones, migrants have cell phones, and, and many of them are self-documenting what's happening. And I think there's, there's great value to that. And then of course, there's the policies that are on the books that are, um, that, you know, are known and, and written and legal documents that our government under the Trump administration in particular developed and tried to defend. Uh, so I think that's also a source of understanding this story and understanding this moment in history and, and you know, in the context of deeper history and now, you know, future events that, that we're living through. So I think it's it's something that we will, and, and I hope that um, a lot of really smart people and invested people will continue to explore and help deepen our understanding. Um, you know, it's always, it's always towards the same goal, which is let's never let this happen again. Um, we haven't been so good at that. And so I think we've got to keep at it in our different ways. Some of us are storytellers, you know, some of us are policymakers, some of us are, are journalists, some of us are running museums. Um, and I think collectively, you know, we'll, 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 I think that the, that quote from, um, uh, well, originally it was Theodore Parker, but that Martin Luther King um, has requoted that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So my hope is that that will be the story of us. Great, thank you both. Rory and Scott, you're both master storytellers using different formats, of course. What are some of the things you think about or approaches you use when telling your stories? Rory, you go. Oh, um, well, do you, are you specifically talking about this documentary or just, or generally? Um, I, I think both. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, I'll talk since this, um, given, given where I am, I'll talk more specifically about this documentary about the global refugee crisis. Um, so this film, we're using a lot of different elements to tell the story. Um, obviously, as I said, we're going back into history. So we're using archive images, photos from places like the St. Louis and, and moving images of which there is some. Um, we're interviewing really brilliant, committed people who are great storytellers themselves, like Scott Miller. Um, who, <laughs> who was fantastic and helped us really understand. And, you know, it's, I, I, I so appreciate Scott and others in our film who have invested so much time and energy and have so many wonderful stories that help connect these historical events to present day lives and help audiences really bridge that gap of not necessarily knowing the history, but becoming interested in it because they themselves are really good storytellers. So I really lean into, you know, people like Scott to, to help me. We're also in this film telling, in addition to a very broad history across many countries, which is challenging, we're also doing individual deep dives with individual stories that help us understand more deeply what it means to experience some of these challenges and issues more personally, more humanly. Um, so we have kind of verite storylines where we're following these stories as they unfold. Some of them we have footage for, some of them we don't. Usually it's a combination. So we're also using animation to help 
people really visually um, understand what some of these individuals have had to grapple with over time. Um, you know, of course, then we also use music and a whole range of kind of editing techniques to help tighten the story. And, and um, I'm working on this like I have with so many films with my um, husband, Mark Bailey, who's also a writer um, and producer of it. And so, you know, figuring out the best way to help, you know, what goes where and, and the order of things is all is always a big challenge when you're making a film like this. Um, uh, thank you, Rory. Um, I'll just add, you know, when I'm a storyteller, in, in, in my case, in, in the book, it's, it's, it's the story of others. Um, it's a lot of personal stories. When we were writing this book, my co-author, Sarah Ogilvy and myself, it was sort of a struggle. You know, are we telling the story of the St. Louis or are we telling the story of the, you know, our search for the passengers or, and the passenger stories? Um, obviously it, 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 it was both. Um, and there's, there was always a struggle between, you know, using archival documentation uh, versus um, oral history. And, you know, we had a holistic approach. I think uh, our book is a combination of a um, lot of interviews with uh, the St. Louis survivors uh, that we met or relatives of uh, victims, um, but also uh, very um, in, in really intense use of uh, archives all over the world. And most of this research we did in the, in the dark ages of the 1990s before there was really the internet as we knew it or digitization. So it meant, as I say, a lot of schlepping all over, all over the world to archives. Uh, fortunately, so much was at the Holocaust Museum archive, but it involved going to Europe and going to Israel and even going to the National Archives in Havana, Cuba. And so it was always balancing that archival work with the um, personal stories. And it was always a race against the clock, mainly because of the interviews, because it was an aging population and a lot of the survivors or eyewitnesses to the St. Louis had passed on. But even with archives, it's a race against the clock. I heard uh, today, even in the uh, Russian bombing of Ukraine, that the memorial at Babi Yar was bombed. So I don't know what type of documentation or artifacts um, were, were destroyed. So it's always a race against the clock to do this type of research. Um, I, that's absolutely true. Um, even thinking about saving um, websites, um, it's a race against the clock when it comes to um, the Ukraine. Um, can you both talk about um, a bit more about the St. Louis and the story of the St. Louis, um, as well as um, the impact that you hope your film will have on people? Well, why, Scott, why don't you, because you wrote a book on it, why don't you right. tell the story of the St. Louis and then I can talk about how we're incorporating it in the film. Okay, well, I'm gonna be obviously very brief. Um, so, uh, and I would imagine many of our viewers know the story, but um, in late May, early June, 1939, a um, ship carrying over 900 Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany was denied entry, not only into Havana, Cuba, but then into the United States after sailing, you know, tantalizingly close to the shores of Miami Beach where the passengers could see the, the, the palm trees and the hotels and, and the beautiful beach and was sent back um, to Europe. Um, fortunately, due to the intervention of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the ship did not have to go back to Germany, sent back to, to um, in, in, uh, the passengers instead disembarked in Antwerp and they were divided between four Western European countries. Um, a year later, three out of those four countries, Belgium, France, and Holland were invaded by the Nazis. So the bulk of the St. Louis passengers, again, were under Nazi control. Um, that's the famous story that many people know, uh, but no one ever knew what happened to the passengers one by one by one. That's what my book and Sarah, Sarah's book, Refuge Denied, um, deals with to us and to our colleagues at the Holocaust Museum, the St. Louis is not one story about a ship, it's 937 stories. That was the number of uh, 
passengers, but it was, it's come to um, symbolize America's inaction and bystanding uh, during the Holocaust and in times of great refugee crisis, which is why I think the story just resonates, you know, even today as we have people like Rory documenting what's happening today. So Rory. Yeah, well, I, I think you said it beautifully, Scott. And, you know, for, for our purposes, going back and looking at this moment in history and helping people. And, you know, I think there, there are a lot of people who know the story of the St. Louis, and then there are a lot of people who've never heard of the St. Louis, right? So helping people understand the context of World War II and the lack of kind of uh, international policies and national policies on uh, accepting refugees, you know, it was really based on quotas, countries, individual countries had quotas of how many refugees they would accept, but it, there was no correlation between that and the need and what was happening in those particular countries. And if people were being threatened, you know, for their lives. Um, and I think, you know, given what happened during World War II, there was an increase in appreciation of the need for that, of, of us to respond globally. Um, so that story of, of the MS St. Louis really, I think, you know, and I, when I tell documentaries, I, it, it can, you know, you don't want, or I don't like stories or, or, you know, even when I went to college classes that were kind of survey classes, right? I much prefer a sort of deep dive into a particular storyline or moment or person. And so this particular story really, I think, captures what our policies were prior to World War II, kind of, um, you know, in a, in a very dramatic and, um, and insightful way. And then, of course, you can really see the parallels when we're looking at what happened in Syria and, you know, people going across different waterways on boats and not being accepted and dying at sea and um, the, the lack of response, responsiveness among wealthy countries in particular. I mean, our film is really focused on how wealthy countries are handling the global refugee crisis in particular. So it's, it's very, it's sort of narrowly focused on that question. Um, and, and this story of the MS St. Louis, I think helps kind of brilliantly contextualize that for us. Thank you. Scott, you touched on this a little bit, um, but feel free to expand on it, both of you. Um, how do you think technology, um, as far as people being able to document their experiences on their own devices, will impact future storytelling? Do you think this um, accessibility of technology worldwide is impacting how we're reacting to the current Ukraine-Russia crisis? Um, and will this perhaps promote a quicker humanitarian response? I hope it, um, it should um, provoke a quicker humanitarian response. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I always, being uh, trained in history, I sort of live in the past, so I'm always comparing things to the past. So again, the idea that, you know, we could access this information on our cell phones, um, or, you know, on our, 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 our laptops. And I always compare it to the 1930s um, where it took so long for information, um, you know, to, to, to be relayed. I mean, it was in telegrams. And, uh, and I know that if there are any younger people on this call, on this Zoom, I said call, uh, Zoom, uh, they won't know what a telegram is. So- um, Or a call. <laughs> or a call, right, right, um, on this Zoom, so yeah. So it's, um, you know, but whether it will lead, you know, whether inf this information will lead to greater action, I, 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 let's say in the case of today, literally today with Ukraine, I, you know, I, I, I certainly hope so. And, you know, just for anyone wanting to, to, you know, and even to learn about the past. I mean, again, when I did this research uh, in the 1990s, there were, you know, I remember, learning what Google was to Google somebody because somebody at the Holocaust Museum, I can't remember when this was, it was a young intern 
maybe in the like the late 1990s when I was looking for information on St. Louis passengers, I said, did you Google them? I'm like, what? And that's how I first learned what Google was. I mean, this didn't exist. So now the ability to get in for, to get information about the past or about the present, um, there are really no excuses. If it does, it, you know, it has to lead to a more, not just humanitarian aid, but humanitarian policy. This, this information's on our in television, it's everywhere. We're, and there are just no excuses. Yeah, I mean, I I really hope so. Um, I really hope that it leads to a more humanitarian response. And, you know, I do think people's hearts are very open to what's happening in the Ukraine and that there has been a sense of kind of unified support um, verbally. But, you know, when you kind of dig into it, like, Great Britain is is saying, well, if you have a if you have a relative um, in Great Britain, then then we'll look to accept you here, right? And the United States, like, there's no, we're gonna let two hundred fifty thousand Ukrainians into our country. Like, I haven't read anything that suggests that we're we're opening our doors, um, which is disappointing. I wish that there was a more decisive, we will accept, you know, X number of Ukrainians and we're going to do it immediately and we're going to set up a, an adoption program and we're going to, you know, integrate them and work with them. And, you know, and there's ways to do like temporary assistance so that they can become citizen, you know, temporary um citizens in our country and and be integrated right and not just um be in a position where they're kind of here but they can't really work and they can't really do anything and you know you look back there was a great empathy for the afghans right and when we left afghanistan and americans you know people were writing checks and whatnot and our hearts were open but there are 75,000 Afghan refugees who are who are in limbo right now in our country, right? So um, it really requires the political will to go beyond just saying, you know, our hearts go out to people to saying our doors are open and we're not going to you know, we're not going to have this just be on Poland and we're not going to have this just be on the neighboring countries. And to the degree that Poland is accepting refugees at high numbers, we should be supporting the Polish government. We should be helping to finance and underwrite that so that the financial burden of those initial period of time isn't just on them. You know, so there's. And, you know, even in the aftermath of the huge numbers of Syrians coming into Europe um, in, you know, 2015, 2016, there's still, and then the backlash against the refugees coming in. So there was the, you know, when Germany is a great example, they accepted, they were incredible. They accepted something like 678,000 Syrian refugees in that period of time. And then there was, you know, a right wing backlash and, uh, you know, right wing members of, of parliament or the government stepped up and, and it now they're now they're deporting 20,000 Syrians every year, right? So it can, um, it's, it can, it can, it ebbs and flows. And I think that what a lot of people feel who really study this and work in the field of global refugees is that we need an integrated policy. We need to anticipate these types of major movements and we need to have a policy where we can accept people proportionately and we know what we're gonna do and it's not like total chaos. Um, so I believe that we're at time right now. Um, so I will um, pass things off to Lorelai. Thank you both. Yep. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for moderating the discussion. And I want to thank 
Rory and Scott for being our speakers and for sharing your insights, your experience and the work on your various projects. If we were meeting in person, you would be hearing thunderous applause. So thank you for this. Thank you, it's great to be here. And now I'd like to say a few closing remarks and share an upcoming event. The Americans in the Holocaust Traveling Exhibition, which is on display until March 9th in the Jack Langston Library, asked tough questions about America's role in this part of history. And it prompted us to ask the question, you know, what was happening in Orange County during this time? How are we impacted by the war effort? And this inspired us to create a complimentary exhibit called Snapshots of Orange County in the 1940s, Spaces, Places, Faces. And this exhibit explores the cultural, economic, and political landscape of Orange County during that era. And it highlights the histories and experiences of diverse multicultural communities in Orange County, including a section on the Jewish community in Orange County during the 1940s. And I'd like to thank Dahlia Taft, director of the Orange County Jewish Historical Society for her help with this section. Now, this exhibit also shows how the introduction of army and air bases brought soldiers and their families from all over the country to our region. And it changed the, the demographics, sorry, and the cultural norms. For more information about this exhibit, please visit uh, the link on the slide or scan the QR code using your smartphones. Now, this exhibit was curated by four people. Nicole Arnold, our research librarian for student success and instruction, Cynthia Johnson, who's our head of reference department and Grenigan Medical Library, John Sisson, research librarian for biological sciences, and Crystal Tribbett, our curator for Orange County regional history and the research librarian for Orange County. Now this exhibit will be on display through fall in the Muriel Ansley Reynolds Gallery in the lobby of the Jack Langston Library. And at this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our donors. It's through your generosity that the UCI libraries can present exciting events, such as this traveling exhibition and related programs, which support education and learning for the UCI campus and the community. And as you can see from this slide, there, there are many ways to support UCI libraries from our Orange County Regional History Collections to our Gateway Society that supports the library public events and programs. But let me highlight one special project. Within the UCI Library Special Collections and Archives Department, we're proud to have over 120 oral histories of Orange County Holocaust survivors and liberators that were recorded in the early 1990s by the Anti-Defamation League of Orange County. Now these oral histories are on VHS videotapes and we would like to digitize them and add transcriptions that will make their stories available online to the world. And if you'd like to support this initiative, please consider making a gift to this project that will honor and provide access to these important oral histories. And to learn more, you can visit the link listed on this slide. Now, today's event is just one of six events we planned in conjunction with the American and the Holocaust exhibition. And next week, we will host our last event of this series. On March 8th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Zoom, we will host a conversation between Deborah Lipstadt and UCI Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Professor of History, Douglas M. Haynes. Now, Deborah has been nominated by President Joe Biden to be a special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism ambassador level position and her appointment is pending Senate confirmation. Deborah and Doug will discuss confronting extremism and anti-Semitism in today's world. And to register for these free events, please visit the link on this slide or the, use the QR code. At this time, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the UCI Center for Jewish Studies and the Jewish Federation of Orange County for their partnership on this event series. And we are also very grateful for the support and collaboration with many other partners on campus. And thanks to the UCI Libraries team, the many library employees, current and past, who helped to make the traveling exhibition and the public programs possible. A recording of this event will be posted on the UCI Libraries YouTube channel, and the link to this recording will also be included in a follow-up email. So thank you all for 